That's one of the most radically modern movies. I could not hit the mark and say my lines. He'll take you there and then top you, you know, he's got that kind of cockiness. You get so much history from one thing done right. Film critic Elvis Mitchell welcomes cinema's brightest to discuss the luminaries who set the course and continue to inspire brilliance on screen today. First up, it's actor Edward Norton. The real magic of him is that he's got this incredibly poignant vulnerability. Elvis Mitchell under the influence. Coming up next. That is actual real artistic courage. Watch exclusive video of Edward Norton at TCM.com slash Elvis Mitchell. She's so great in that movie. It's so bold. Uncut and commercial free on Turner Classic Movies. Welcome to Under the Influence. I'm Elvis Mitchell. My guest for this episode is a, a friend and a two-time Oscar nominee, a Golden Globe winner, but I'm going to hold that against him, Edward Norton. Ed, first of all, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, thanks for doing the show. Pleasure. But Edward, I have to, because I, I know that you're somebody as an actor who's really conscious of film in general, and to have gotten to work with somebody who I'm sure was an influence on you in his way, Milos Forman, when you did The People versus Larry Flynn. Sure. In fact, that was the main reason I got involved with the movie. On a script level, initially, I didn't understand what he w what it was really about, or why anyone wanted to make a movie on that subject. It, it didn't it didn't actually hook me uh, as a script. But I, I had a couple of really seminal learning experiences on that movie. I, I think I, I came out of a theater background, even though I was a big fan of films. And I remember I hung around on that set all the time, even when I wasn't working, just because I wanted to watch Milos work and. There's a scene between Larry Flint and Althea Flint and Woody Harrelson and Courtney Love. You have two extremely improvisational, free-form kind of actors. and One who had basically has no acting training. Yeah, exactly. Boy. And he let them just riff around the, the subject of their relationship and, and should they get married and all these things. And he rolled it and rolled it and rolled it. And I remember thinking, wow, that was just all over the place. He didn't get anything there. And then watching him in the cutting room months later, cutting that together, he, he shaped this scene that had never taken place in one go that way. And I, and I just, I remember, I, I remember sitting in the cutting room going, this is one of the greatest lessons I will ever learn about making a movie. Like, it made me realize how plastic the whole thing was. Uh, there's a great book by an editor. Who, Ralph Rosenblum. Ralph Rosenblum. The shooting stops, the cutting begins. Right, yeah, one of the great books about editing. Isn't it amazing how scary that book is? It really is. What Annie Hall was going to be, the the that His account of how Annie Hall became Annie Hall is, to me, like... A, a must read. Now, had you read that before you worked with Woody? Did you? Yeah, know I had before? actually. I mean, we talk about influence and things. I mean, certainly for me, growing up, Woody Allen's movies just were were like something totally apart. I, I, and my, was Annie Hall one of those? For sure. I remember really distinctly uh, as a kid seeing Annie Hall and going, "There's there's no structure. There's no." I mean, I didn't use those words then, but I was watching it going. I remember sort of having the thought, this guy's just doing whatever he wants to do. There's a piece of animation in it, and he's talking to the camera, and, and the story hops back and forward in time, and, and it, it was so liberated, it was so um, incredibly uh, free. And you know something, I don't think I mind analysis at all. The only question is, is will it change my wife? Will it change your wife? 
Will it change my life? Yeah, but you said, will it change my wife? No, I didn't. I said, will it change my life, Alvi? You said, will it change wife? You said, life. Will it I said, she life. She said, will it change my wife? And he turns to the camera and goes, you were there, so you know I'm not crazy. And he just goes back into the scene. And then I just, I remember as a kid seeing that and just going, what? Like, you can do that? That's hysterical, you know? There's a kind of this sort of, let's try it on and see if it works spirit. Too, totally. Right? And, and I remember thinking at the time, there's no way that, that a movie this could be made like this unless the person making it is at the peak of their powers. And that's the vision, the view I held of that until I read Ralph Rosenblum's book, in which you realize that making that movie was like the antithesis of that. It was, he had a totally different idea of what it was going to be. He followed it out. It wasn't working. He wasn't liking it. He looked at what he was liking about it, decided to follow that, expand on it, throw away a lot, reshoot, and, and it morphed all the way through the making of it until it had become this thing. And it blows apart your whole notion of, of kind of artistic prowess. And, but then what I realized is, no, that, that, is, that is actual real artistic courage. And, Courageous people are the ones who've let it continue to reveal itself to them and, and, and don't, you know, put the iron fist on it and try to clamp it down. You seem to be attracted to guys who have a voice in their head or a vision in their head about what it is they want to see, uh, be it Fincher or, or Spike or, or Woody Allen or even, I, I would say, uh, in Down in the Valley. It's like you're doing Fonda <laughs> in a Terrence Malick movie to me in that yeah, movie. Yeah, David Jacobson, who's the wonderful director of that movie, we talked a lot about um, uh, Malick. He, he was deeply influenced by Malick. And I think influence is beautiful when it, it's not just ripping off, it's that, it, it's that someone's affected you, it goes through you, it gets bent through the prism of somebody else and comes out this, this other thing. And, Joseph, Joseph Campbell, the great, you know... Hero with a Thousand Faces. Yeah, the, the, the great philosopher on myth and storytelling, really. He, he's got this great point, which is that there really are a limited number of stories, and we just retell them over and over and over again. And, and he says and, it's and really... And only one hero journey. Yeah, and each generation retells those stories for themselves. They, and he has this idea of transparency, which is that the way stories really work are as if you can see through the story somehow and see how it's really about you. And, like we made this cop corruption movie called Pride and Glory. And, um, and I remember saying to the director, why do we need to make another New York cop corruption story? And he said something astute, which is he kind of went, well, I, I think we need to make our corruption story. You know what I mean? And I, and I knew what he was saying because you can make Serpico in the 70s and, and that's a cop corruption story for the 70s in the sense that like, Serp, what is Serpico really? He's, he's a beatnik. The character Serpico, Al Pacino in the hat living in the village, it's transparent for that generation because they see themselves in Serpico. You know, the, the, the people of that generation, they go, yeah, he's one of us. So again, it's a story about a, a corruption in an institution. The same institution, the New York City Police Department. So why do it again? Well, because we're not talking about the problems in the early 70s. We're doing it refracted through the experience that our, gen kind of, yeah, our generation is going through. Sure, a different through. kind of mistrust. But right. I wonder if Lamette's one of those guys for you, because there's Serpico, and then a few years later, there's Dog Day Afternoon, which is the other side, which is Al right. Pacino literally on the other side of the barricade. He's not a cop. Right. He's somebody who wants to become a part of the system. I just wonder if Pacino and Lamette are those guys for you who are kind of Lamette, touchdowns. I, you know, oh, yeah. And, and you've talked to Spike Lee also. I mean... Spike loved Lumet's movies, and I'll tell you, like, when you talk about connections, influence, like, one of the things I see in Spike's movies that I admi admire hugely, that, I, that, it, that to me marked Lumet as, like, one of the really great filmmakers in that era, was that these are filmmakers who are rolling around in the moment that they're living in, you know what I mean? Like, Lumet, Lumet made movies about what was going on in the moment that he was living in. I mean... Dog Day Afternoon, Network, you know, 12 Angry Men, going back to 12 Angry Men. Like, he took a look at what was going on around him, felt the pulse and the energy of, of the places he lived and that he knew, felt what the issues were, what, and he made movies about them, you know? And Spike, Spike to me is probably, and this isn't a reduction, it's a real compliment, I, I think Spike's the most socially conscious 
filmmaker of his generation. And Spike's rolled around in race, sports, and, and fame, you know, money, drugs. Um, he's, he's looked at it all. And, and, and he's consistently just gone at very challenging examinations of what makes modern life in America challenging. But and there are always questions, even when there's, be it race or not, it's always questions of masculinity for Spike. Yeah. But also that same thing that you said about the Mets films. Provocative, topical, but, but full of pathos. Like, I mean, Spike is so, Spike can be so iconoclastic as a person that I think sometimes people miss in his movies how compassionate they are. Spike's films are really compassionate. I think he has a great, I think he has a lot of empathy for everybody. Like, if you take a movie like Do the Right Thing, it's a real equal opportunity. You know, I mean, he, he, he hits everybody just as hard. Yo! Yo! Yeah. You almost knocked me down, man. The word is excuse me. Ah, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Not only did you knock me down, you used to buy my brand new Fuck white Air Jordans that I just bought. And that's all you can say is excuse me. Are you serious? Fuck yeah, I'm man. serious. I'll fuck you up quick two times. Two times. Who told you to step on my sneakers? Who told you to walk on my side of the block? Who told you to be in my neighborhood? I own this brownstone. Who told you to buy a brownstone on my block in my neighborhood on my side of the street? I'm out of here. Yo, man, bring yeah, his feet. Bring his bars. Bars. Take his gun. I should make you buy me another pair. Then why'd you move back to Massachusetts? I was born in Brooklyn. Oh! And, and it's like, you know, he's, he, he sticks it back on everybody. I mean, I was in the movie theater when, that, when those scenes hit where the camera cut right to the Korean grocer and then the white guy and then the black guy going, you know, screaming those harangues of epithets, racial epithets at each other. That movie was like a hand grenade. You know what I mean? I mean, that movie was like a hand grenade went off in the theater. Like, people, people were going, what? Like... Nobody said that stuff at that point. Even in 1989, you know, Public Enemy, that level of like of 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 expressed rage. And like I said, even I'd seen Annie Hall and things like that. But at that time, for me, that that movie mattered. Like like you know, you talk about things that influence. I, there's something. There's an appeal to, I guess, what I would call like um, powerful performances. You know what I mean? Like like obviously, people my age. Uh, are, were very affected by De Niro. Which De Niro films are you thinking? Oh, about? you know, um, Godfather Two, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, uh, King of Comedy. I just want—is there a scene in King of Comedy, specific scene that really spoke to you? Well, over time, King of Comedy, King of—I've come to feel that King of Comedy, like people have a, talk a lot about uh, Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, but but Taxi Driver and Raging Bull to me are brilliant films, brilliant films but but not really linked in a way I think I think Taxi Driver and King of Comedy are actually much more linked as films in the sense that in both of those movies Scorsese and De Niro together I feel like are they're looking at the they're looking at what happens to people who get left behind by the American dream you know they're, they're looking at a very they're looking at a very particular kind of pathology in those two movies which is the the underbelly of of American life. You know, Taxi Driver is really about the dark underbelly of 